this is really not going to be for beginners. So most of you have been connected with my big toe for some time. You've seen videos, you've read books. Many of you have probably read the books a couple of times and seen lots of videos. And that's really the group that this is meant to interact with. The people who are just coming into it for the first time, who haven't read the books, who haven't watched many videos and, and don't really understand it in some depth, um, you're going to be a little lost here, maybe, because we're going to, I'm not going to derive background. There is a logical derivation that gets us, you know, to the, to the point that we're going to be talking today. And if you don't have that, it might seem like we're just making this up out of, you know, the thin air. So if that's the case, then go to uh, YouTube, look up the Calgary um, or the, the master uh, workshop from New York or the first one I did in Spain. Any of those three are kind of comprehensive workshops. They're called workshops. And uh, the Calgary is probably the best of those three, but in any case, give that a look and that will bring you up to speed in a lot of the things we say that will make more sense. And the books are free on Google Books if you want to if you want to read the books. Things that I'm going to add this morning are mostly, except for the first one, they're mostly going to be about physics. And I, you know, I, I kind of expect people to go, oh, physics, really? But, you know, I'm a physicist and uh, you know, I talk physics, that's what I do. So I, we need to talk about physics because if we're ever going to get the high priest of science to understand that love is the answer, we'll need to speak their language. So I need to do this some. And I'll try to keep it at a level that everybody can understand. And I've got, again, I have slides. The slides have a lot more detail in them than any good slide should have. But I don't have slides really, you know, with the idea that you read everything on a slide. That's not the point. The slides are just there so that later, if you want to go back and revisit, you'll have kind of a logical process of what we talked about on the slides. So the slides are really busy, but you don't have to read them. You can just listen and I'll tell you basically what's on the slide. But if you want to go back later, you can go to my website or you can go to Don and Keith's website, which is www.mbtevents. And uh, I have all the websites up there if you can read that. Anyway, uh, you, can, you can get the slides then later and rather than just a picture with a word or two on it, which then wouldn't do much for your memory or wouldn't give you a whole lot of information, it would be a good slide, but it wouldn't be very helpful later on. I've buried these slides with lots and lots of words, you know, so they're not very effective slides for a presentation, but they're real effective for looking at it later. So don't feel like you have to read everything. Paying attention to what I say is more important than, than taking the trouble to try to read the slide. Particularly, you'll see the next one, which is a little tiny type, and you know, probably can't see it more than about the third or fourth table back, and so on. But don't worry about that. It's not necessary. Don't get a lot of angst that you can't read the slide and you're missing something. You're really not. All right. Now, this first uh, set of questions comes from Aubrey, and uh, he wrote uh, an email that I got uh, a couple of weeks ago. And he had some questions that were mainly about the environment. You know, uh, something like this. Uh, how can we improve our relationship with the earth? How can we reconnect with nature and stop destroying, harming it? And he's talking about things like, um, you know, climate change, peak oil, resources, overpopulation, GMO, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the second part of his was more, more, um, little picture ideas and that was what can we do what sort of technologies you know agriculture nutrition sustainability distribution of wealth you know these are specific ideas and what should we be thinking and doing about these things do we have any new and better ideas so I want to talk about that a little bit and uh, you'll see I've labeled this one how to save the world and yourself at the same time you know, how we treat the environment is important, of course, but it's not just the environment that we treat badly, you know. How do we treat each other? 
Well, you know, wars, oppression, racism, fascism, greed, you know, how do we treat each other? And then how do we treat all the other living things? You know, animal abuse, cruelty, species extinctions. So it's not that we're particularly taking it out on the environment. We act the same way with the same methods and the same attitudes toward everything. So the problem isn't so much our environmental problems. It's basically a symptom of low quality of consciousness. It's just the way we are. We're expressing who we are. And that's who we are, whether it's what we do to the environment, what we do to each other, or what we do to the other living things on the planet. That's just us. Okay, now, how do we deal with this? Well, first, I'm going to talk about some big picture things. Uh, the most important thing is to focus on solutions. Don't focus on the problems. Okay? If you focus on the problems, you're going to find them whether they exist or not. If you're looking for an issue, if you're looking for a problem, even if the problem isn't there, you will find it. It kind of reminds me of the story of the man in New York who was afraid of elephants, and you know, when a bush would shake, he knew there was an elephant hiding behind it. If he saw a bunch of puddles on the road, then those were elephant tracks, you see. You will find what you're looking for. If you have a fear, that fear will find something to justify the fear. So first off, focus on the solutions, not on the problems. Um, now you have to be aware of problems. Don't mistake me. I'm not saying you ignore it. You let it go and say, oh, well, nothing I can do about that. That's not the answer either. But don't attach your ego to the problem. Or don't let them dominate your awareness or become overwhelmed by the immensity and the intractability you know, of the problem. Because when your ego gets attached to the problem, that's when you start to become a part of that problem. As soon as your ego is attached to it, then you become part of the problem yourself. See, so that's, that's a problem. And, and your life can turn into some sort of joyless struggle, uh, unending journey through fear, anxiety, frustration, and anger, because here's this problem, and you're trying as hard as you can to fix it, and Nothing happens. Nobody cares. Well, you and your friends care, but on a big scale, on what, you know, on the, the environment or on each other, nothing really seems to happen. And then you can get real upset with that. Then you get depressed with it. And you see, you haven't done yourself any good. That's why I added the title, How to Save the World and Yourself at the Same Time. So that's, that's important. Okay. Our... Uh, you know, our uh, reaction to the fact that the problem is us. Okay, we admit that, the problem is us. Now we have a reaction to that fact, and that reaction requires compassion and patience rather than fear, anxiety, anger, you know, arrogance. I know the answer. I know what all you stupid people should be doing, and why aren't you doing it? You see, that's, a, that's the arrogance and the anger. So that's not the way to do it. Now, there's two things that we can do to work with these problems. Okay? One of them is we can grow up, we as a people. And that's the best thing because then that solves the problem. The second thing is that we can um, address the symptoms of the problem. Now, addressing symptoms is civilizing. It's good. It creates better behavior. For instance, how do we address symptoms? Laws. Laws are addressing symptoms of low quality of consciousness. Criminal law I'm talking about. Why do we need criminal law? We need criminal law because we have criminals. We have people with low quality of consciousness that would like to take things away from other people, like to do violence, like to you know, run over other people's free will choices. So we invoke law. But whenever you impose a a solution, and you can only impose symptomatic solutions. You can't impose a real solution, which is grow up. You can't make anybody grow up. So you impose a symptomatic solution, and you get a downside. You get a problem. So we have law, and it's good. It keeps the criminals off the streets. But what does it also do? It locks up innocent people. Sometimes the law 
seems to be on the side of the problem, you know, racism or, you know, suppressing, you know, voter turnout and things that the law was really meant to protect and now the law is on the other side. So there's a downside to all your symptomatic things. Now, what do we usually think about in symptomatic, uh, you know, solutions like um, structural changes, legal changes, leadership changes, we just got the bums out, you know, put somebody in, it was good, you know, everything would be better. These are all symptomatic changes. You're just trying to fix the symptoms of low quality consciousness. The only way to fix the real thing is to grow up. And there is no quick path to growing up and you cannot force anybody else to grow up. You can only grow up yourself. That's the biggest and most important thing you can do to save the world is save yourself. So if you get too uh, wound up in it, you can end up being part of the problem. Now, second topic. Um, this one's just kind of fun, I thought. Uh, I wanted to talk about it. Those of you who are, who are uh, newbies to this idea, i uh, give you a little background. Uh, the idea is that this reality that we're living in is a virtual reality. And a virtual reality um, is a computed reality, which means it's a simulation. And when you compute things in a simulation, you always have a, a sort of a bottom level of resolution, just like you have in photography or just like you have on your television set. So if you, if you think of a, of a monitor that you have on your computer or, or your TV, it's divided up into pixels. And that's the limit of your resolution. Right, you have a pixel, and the pixel has three attributes. It has its position, it has color, and it has intensity. And everything you see on that screen, all the world is presented to you on that screen is by manipulating those three things. Well, in this virtual reality that we're living in, in our physical universe, we have a 3D universe, not a flat screen with a pixel of area. We have a little delta V here, which is a pixel of volume, if you will, a 3D pixel, just a little chunk of volume. So here's a bunch of those little chunks of volume in a, in a, in a box. And though we have X, Y, and Z, which is um, you know, right, left, and up, if you like, uh, we're just going to talk about going in this direction here in the delta X. Well, the way it works in a virtual reality is that you update it, just like your monitor, every delta T, every unit of time you update your monitor. So if you have a monitor that has a uh, 60 hertz refresh rate, then every 1 60th of a second, all those pixels are redone. You calculate new intensity and new color for each of the positions of the pixels every 1 60th of a second. If you've got a newer TV, it's maybe one 120th. Okay, twice as fast, and they say that's good for sports and fast moving objects, you know, going across the screen because it's updates twice as much. Then it's one 120th of a second for every update. Well, we have the same thing in this simulation, and that's called delta T. It's a quantum of time. And as fast as you can move something through this simulation is that you go one delta X every delta T. So if you happen to be sitting in this little box of volume, the next delta T you can go to here, the next delta T to here, and the next delta T to here. And that's as fast as you can get through the simulation. Because in this simulation, we don't skip. We don't say one delta T you're here, and the next delta T you're here. That's teleporting, and teleporting isn't allowed. It's not part of the rule set. So we have this maximum speed that anything can travel in this virtual reality, and that's what we call the speed of light. Okay. Now, Every other speed has to be less than that. Well, how do you get speeds that are less than that? Well, there's only, this is the, the neat idea. You can only do one of two things during a delta T. You can either move from one, from one uh, quantum of volume to the next quantum of volume, or you cannot move at all. Those are the only two choices, okay? Which gives us the neat idea that when we move, just our motion, all of our motion, we are moving at the velocity of light or standing still. Well, how is it that we get this nice kind of smooth motion down here? Well, I, I'm going to talk about that a little. Well, here's the, uh, so I just say this, if an object moves 
uh, one delta x, each delta t, it moves the speed of light, and each delta x, any object may go either the velocity c or stand still, velocity zero. I don't know if you can read this, but here's some of the, the numbers. Velocity of light is 10 to the eighth meters per second. Our delta x is what's called a Planck length, that's 10 to the minus 36 meters. And our delta t is very, very small, 10 to the minus 44 seconds Planck unit of time. Okay, so those are the, those are the numbers. Well, well, how could we go slower? Well, let's say we're here, and the next delta t, we move here, and the next delta t, we stay still. Next delta t, we go here, next delta t, we stay still. And so we alternate, right? We're going c, we're going zero. We're going c, we're going zero. Our average velocity is half the speed of light. That's how we get to move around. Well, I wonder how many times we have to stay still. How many delta t's do we have to stay still in order for me to move my hand this fast or enable for you to walk, say, one meter a second. That's basically a pretty brisk walking speed. It's about a meter a second. Okay. It turns out that you need to move something like uh, 100 million to move one meter a second. You have to stand still for 100 million delta T for one C. So you're averaging 100 million delta T's of zero to one of speed of light, and that's a brisk walk. So all of our measured, all of our measured speeds are average. See, it's an average speed, not an instantaneous speed, but an average speed, and we average over a lot of zeros to get the kind of speeds that we live with every day. Now that, the only reason for mentioning that is that it's kind of uh, interesting, and I'm going to go past that chart and that chart because, well, the only thing interesting here is, I'm not going to explain all this, it's going to take too long and most of you aren't all that interested, but this is a little equation that tells you the n over n plus m, here's the definition of n, here's the definition of m, so n is the time increments that you actually move at velocity c and m is the time increments you actually move at velocity zero. So it's the number you move at C over the sum of the number you move at C plus the number you move at M, right? It's that you do an average, you do, you take the values of C's, divide it by the total, multiply that times C, and that's the fraction. So when it was every other one, C, zero, C, zero, C, zero, okay, you'd have a certain number of C's, but you'd have more because this is the C's plus the zeros. The thing to know there is that N plus M is always equal to or bigger than n. So you can never get above c. See, that fraction is always less than 1. So that's an interesting thing, but we won't go through that. It's in the, it's in the mix if you want. Um, this is why I bring it up. This is what's interesting about it. And that is not only that we, we all move at the velocity of light, right, and then we stand still a lot. That's kind of a neat concept in itself. But the, the key here is that uh, when you have this fact, there are measurable odd things that happen out in the margins. If you're going very, very slow or very, very fast, you will now see quantum effects that are there because the reality is a virtual reality. So if you could measure very, very small times and very, very fast speeds, you would get to a point where very odd things would happen. On the slow end, if you had something that was going slower and slower and slower and slower, you'd get to a point where even though it was still moving, still getting slower, and had a long way to go before it got to zero, you couldn't measure anything but a zero. In other words, you'd get to a kind of a cutoff point, and after that, all you'd get was zeros while this thing still was slowing down. So you'd get an odd thing. And up on the upper end, you'd get the other thing. You had something going faster and faster and faster, you'd get to a point where your measurement, which was, you know, you only measure over a certain distance in a certain time, where that choice of distance and time actually would mean that even though it was still speeding up, all you could measure was C. In other words, you have discrete chunks. Now, if you took that distance where you could only measure, you could only measure C, you couldn't get above, say, this velocity V, and you measured it over a bigger distance, now you could measure higher velocity and a bigger distance. And why is that? Because you need enough distance to get enough zeros in 
to average with the C, you see, or enough C's in to average with one zero, and that takes time, and of course time is also distance, see, when we're measuring speed of light. So that's kind of an, an interesting idea, that uh, there is something that's called falsifiable about the virtual reality. We just need to be able to measure very small and, and uh, very fast things. We can't measure that yet. So these are not things that something can go out, somebody can go out and do tomorrow. But Einstein had that problem too. It was two, as many as three decades before we were capable of making the measurements that, that um, told us that Einstein's theory of relativity was indeed correct. But for the first decade or so, it was too hard to do. Well, this is too hard to do now by a lot of orders of magnitude, but it's falsifiable. Now, I'll explain falsifiable a little bit. That's a word that you've probably heard. Um, some people get confused with it because they'll hear a scientist say that we, science should not be interested and is not interested in anything that's not falsifiable. And they say, oh, what? Science isn't interested in something unless you can prove that it's false. Why would science only be interested in false things? You know, well, that's not what it means at all. Let's do a little example first. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, have a theory, a theory of gravitation. It's Newton's theory. And that's that the reason we have gravitation is that masses attract each other. Okay, that's what Newton said. Masses attract each other. So we have this big, massive Earth, and then we have objects like this pretend rock I'm holding in my hand. And if I drop this pretend rock, you know, it goes down because it's a mass and the Earth is a mass and the Earth attracts it. Okay, Newton came up with that and it worked really well. We found out all kinds of things. We could suddenly understand the trajectories of, you know, in our planetary system and lots of other things just suddenly made sense to us once we got there. And that was the theory of gravity for a very long time. And is that falsifiable? Well, yes, it is falsifiable. And the reason it's falsifiable is I can do this test. Here's my, here's my experiment. I can take this rock, I can open my hand, and my theory is that masses attract each other, and if this rock just floats and doesn't fall down, then my theory is false. You see? Now, but what if we look at it the other way? If I open my hand and it falls down, then is my theory true? No, it's not true. You see, the only thing that's true is the fact that gravity exists. That it is, that its cause is masses attracting each other. In Newton's terms, it was proportional to the product of the masses divided by the square of the distances between their centers. That you know, proportionality constant was called g for gravitation. So that's g m1, m2 over the distance squared between them. So it doesn't say that that's true. So you see, the point is, it's easy to do an experiment and say something's false. It's very hard to do an experiment and say that something's true. So then, that's why we call it the theory of gravitation, because it's just a theory. What we have is a measured fact, drop things, they fall. But why that's a fact is a hard thing, you know, to, uh, a hard thing to do. And, you know, if you're Newton, you don't know it, but some guy named Albert may come along, you know, uh, you know, 60, 70, 100 years, 150 years later, and uh, say that the gravity is not because masses attract, it's just bend in space-time. It's space-time uh, geometry is what creates gravity. It doesn't have anything to do with masses attracting. Oh, and then there's another group of physicists, a, a minor group, they're not very large in number, who believe that gravity is really an electromagnetic phenomena. So you see, the falsifiability is a good rule for, for science because it's, it's much easier to show that something doesn't work, because if it doesn't work one time, it doesn't work. Then it is that it does work, because we know the fact that we measure works, but we don't know why. So the theory that theory is falsifiable, but that doesn't mean that it's true. Anyway, that's the whole idea. So what we have about, uh, so what we know about falsifiable is that first you need a prediction. You need a theory and then a prediction, okay? And then you need an objective physical experiment that can prove the prediction is wrong. 
If you got that, then you're falsifiable. Notice, the concept of falsification is based on the assumption that all facts are physical, because you need a physical experiment. Okay, now if you're working in things that aren't necessarily physical, things that aren't that uh, buttoned down, things that don't have, that have much uncertainty about them, then this falsifiable requirement really doesn't apply. Scientific method has a similar problem. Scientific method says that every experiment done anywhere by anybody has to give you the same answer. If it doesn't, then you can't believe the results of the experiment. Well, that assumes all scientific experiments are entirely objective. Well, there's a lot of science that doesn't fit those two rules. It's not falsifiable, and every experiment done in the same place by anybody isn't the same, and that's what we call soft science, right? That's sociology, psychology, economics, medicine, political science, and of course, consciousness studies. They fit in that group of, they're not falsifiable, and they don't abide by the scientific method, but yet they do good science. Medicine does some good science. We're, we're glad about that. Our, our uh, life expectancy has gone up uh, you know, by a decade in the last 50 or 60 years because of this medical science that doesn't meet falsification requirements or, or uh, the uh, scientific method requirements. So. Uh, You will hear a lot of complaints by the hard scientists that the soft scientists aren't really science at all. But that's a very prejudiced view of science. You can do a lot of science with statistics. And that's how the soft sciences do their work. You see, they can't falsify that an aspirin, um, that an aspirin uh, relieves a headache. Because here's the experiment. Guy has a headache, you give him an aspirin. And he says, hmm, didn't affect me. It's done. Science then would say, let's not look at aspirin. Doesn't have any effect. Not false. You know, it's, it's false. Well, what, a, what the makers of aspirin have to do, they have to find, find 1,000 people with headaches and give them all aspirin. And if 800, 800 of them get rid of their headache and the control group that had sawdust instead of aspirin, only 200 of them get rid of their headache, then they do some statistics and they come out with statistical uh, validation of the concept. But that is not hard science. But it's good science, just the same. So that's a kind of a, an idea. We're going to talk about this falsifiability and uh, gravity a little later, so I want to kind of introduce it here. All right. Where am I? Next one. Biological evolution. This one uh, kind of bumped into my my brain uh, just a few months ago when there was a conversation on YouTube and one gentleman, uh, David Mathias, I believe it was, he, uh, he was arguing that evolution just had this problem about um, everything having to be generated from a random mutation. Okay? And evolution does believe that. All the change is randomly generated. So you have an organism and that organism has a mutation which changes it. If that mutation improves its survivability or its ability to procreate, then that su succeeds, it goes on, and if it doesn't, it goes away. Okay, that's the simple thing, that's what drives evolution. But evolution has some problems with that, you see. If that's the case, then there should be a lot more diversity. I know we have a very diverse, you know, living things and, and plants and so on. It's very diverse, but it should be much more diverse than it is because you don't have to necessarily be the best idea in evolution. You just have to be good enough that you can survive and procreate. So there's room for lots of things. And this was brought home by an article that I had read a couple of years before, and it kind of clicked with me now that, that I saw this argument on YouTube, and that was there was this species of moth that was a new species of moth that was found in Britain. The moth was black, mostly black, charcoal gray or whatever, 
and it hadn't been there before, so we had a new species. And then they realized that it's not a new species. There was a moth, some other part of the world, that was white, that was actually the same species. It was identical in every way except for the color. And then they realized that that moth that was black in Britain had come, you know, had been imported, basically came on a ship like a lot of critters do. They hitchhike on ships and then they find an environment where they can flourish. And this one flourished in around the cities and in industrial areas in Britain. But those areas were kind of dark and sooty and, and uh, weren't nearly as light and bright as the rural areas that it had come from. Well, the problem was that this transition from white moth to black moth took place in a decade or maybe a decade and a half. And if you have only random mutations, there's a whole lot of colors and shades of colors and patterns of colors that are just have to be random before you turn up with a solid black moth. That's a tough one to get randomly. How many, you know, how many different shades of color are they? And how many different patterns are there? And then mix those up together, how many different random mutations would you have to have before you ended up with this one, you see? And in biology, these processes of evolution take hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. You don't get a black moth from a white moth in a decade, or even two decades, or even 10 decades. You see, that's too short for the random process to be. Uh, and I'd read an article by the biology community, and they were discussing this moth, and they were saying, we just don't know. You know, how did this happen? And then that triggered when I was got this conversation on, on uh, YouTube. So the idea was obvious. You know, there's intent as well as randomness driving future probability. So you have a moth, and a moth is a conscious critter. It's not the kind of conscious we are, but it probably has enough consciousness to know when it needs to hide, or that it's at risk, or that there's predators that are being very successful against them. And this moth has this, mm, I need some place to hide. You know, this is, this is not good, and his hiding's not working for him because he's white in a dark environment, and he stands out uh, very clearly to the predators. So that intent, just a simple intent is, so I have to hide, would then bias the probabilities, the future probabilities of what mutations might happen. See, a mutation is a random draw from the probability distribution. Like any change, like any data that comes into this, this reality, it's a random draw from a probability distribution. Now, if you start biasing those probabilities to meet the intent, which is I need a place to hide, then you, you see that it doesn't take sampling through five million possibilities of color randomly to get the one that works for you, the one that works for you can pop up very quickly. So that's a whole nother dimension to biological evolution that the, bio, the uh, evolutionary biologists really don't understand or don't know about. So basically we speed, we speed up the acquisition of a solution. Okay? And this is true for all evolution, you know, it's just moths, you know, all of us, us too, all the critters and everything. We speed up the acquisition of a workable solution, and then we tend to stay with what works. Why? Because consistency and success are very valuable. We value consistency. We got something that works, we want to hang on to it. We don't want to say, well, this works pretty good, but Let's take a wing on something else and see how that works. That's not the way critters are. Critters find something that works, they stick with it, and uh, they value the, the success. So that's why we don't have so much diversity, because once we find something that works, which is biased because of our intent, we stay with it. We don't just keep trying new things. So that solves a, a big current problem. And I call that a nutation, just because it sounds like mutation and it kind of goes together with, with um, mutation. And what, a, what the word mutation means is if you have, a, you have some, some kind of central value, some kind of need, like needing to hide, mutation means you kind of wobble around that. There's lots of you know, little things that, that work for your hiding and they kind of wobble around that center. That wobbling function is called a mutation in physics and mathematics. So think of this as a metaphor where you have where you are at the center 
and we're going to now let direction be possibility. So you could mutate, you could change in this direction or that direction or that direction. You can change in all these different directions and if it's random, you just reach up and randomly pick one of those things and that takes you a long time to find the one you want because there's millions of these different directions you could go. But you have an intent. That intent creates a bias to it to be in this direction toward a darker color because you live in a darker environment. Now you've got this bias. But there's maybe 10 or 20 different colors and patterns. You could be charcoal gray with black spots. You know, you could be different kinds of things that would work. And the probability kind of nutates around all those possibilities, kind of wobbles around. And then a biological mutation happens. You reach into the probability distribution and those things are, that you're mutating about are more likely to come out, you see? So then that's, that's how it works. So you not only have random mutation, but you have a mutation where the probability can be biased toward fulfilling an intent. And that's a real big thorn in the side of evolutionary biologists because they don't understand that and they don't know why we don't have all this diversity that we should have or why that moth could change that color that quickly. So that's the, that's the solution. All right, now my last one uh, is how is physical reality produced? Um, there's really two ways to produce a reality. Okay, one of them is the one that our science has espoused, and that's particles. Okay, the particle model. It's a physical model. A model. What that says is that all reality, everything that actually exists, is composed of and generated by material particles. Okay, that's also called materialism. Okay, so you can only, you have this philosophy if you are a materialist. The other way is it's a virtual reality. Now, virtual reality means that it's information. Your reality is a computed reality. Okay, they're very different. But now there's two kinds of virtual realities. Virtual realities come in two flavors. One is deterministic, and the other one is probabilistic. Now, in physics today, we have a lot of physicists. It's kind of a, a movement that's really gaining speed to realize that this physical reality is really information-based. It's a virtual reality. Many physicists are coming to that conclusion because the experiments they do just scream that out at them. That's the only way to explain an experiment. It's virtual reality. But almost to a, a man, they would all fall to the side of it's a deterministic reality. And determinism is very important. You, determinism is actually a, a logical conclusion of materialism. If you have materialism, then it's like you have, it's like building a reality out of Legos. You know, you put all the Legos together and you end up with something bigger and more complex. And you build it out of these piece parts. And whatever you end up with is determined by the Legos, where you place the Legos, you know, where you stick them together. So there is, there is no room for, well, maybe it'll be this way, maybe it'll be that way. Once you know where all the Legos are, it's determined, see? And a materialistic view is, is like that. So materialists, if they're honest, um, to, their, to their beliefs would tell you that if they knew all the initial conditions of every particle in the universe, they could compute everything that would ever happen in the future for all time. Because now all you have to do is trace the particles, you know, follow the particles and see what they do, and that's what happens. And because all the particles just move and interact according to rules, it's like Legos, they stick together, you know, when the when the little bumps go into little holes, that's where they, that's where they go, and it's, it's the same sort of thing, then they will say that there is no such thing as free will. And there is no such thing as consciousness. We only, we are having, a, we have an illusion of consciousness. We have an illusion of free will. But everything is really just determined, and for that matter, we're probably not, you know, even animated and alive except in our own in our own view of reality we're just particles so that's an obviously strange conclusion we have no free will we have no consciousness you know but 
And most scientists probably wouldn't stand up and say that in public. But that is the logical conclusion of materialism. That's, um, you know, that's where you have to go. That's the logical result of it. And some scientists will stand up and say that because they are sticking to their, to their beliefs. Others kind of feel like that sounds kind of stupid, so they wouldn't say it in public, but you know, that's the way they feel. So we, <clears throat> we have that uh, determinism. Now I want to just contrast these a little bit so that you know the difference and can appreciate a little bit of the difference between building up a reality out of particles and using probability and what that means. Because I talk a lot about it's a probable reality, but I don't really tell you too much about what that means. So I'm going to give you an example. And it's, let's take an old Civil War type cannon. Okay, because it's a very simple thing. You know, very few moving parts. It's easy to understand. So we have this cannon. And basically the way the cannon works is it's a hollow tube and it has a fuse, goes through a little hole inside the chamber at the back end. In the front end, first you put gunpowder, you push it down, then you put some, some packing to make sure the gunpowder stays there and, and is wadded up. So you put in a, a wad and then you roll the cannonball down on top of that. You light the fuse, the gunpowder burns, creates a lot of heat, which creates a lot of pressure, which pushes the cannonball out the other end. Okay, very simple. So let's look at that both probabilistically and deterministically. Now, I guess after it goes out the other end, it flies through the air and it depends on gravitation, it depends on air, it depends on pressure, altitude. There's a lot of variables that it goes. Well, the inside, what happens inside the barrel is called interior ballistics. What happens outside the barrel is called exterior ballistics. Now, interior ballistics are very, very complicated. Exterior ballistics are actually complicated too, but not as much. When that gunpowder, when that fuse lights, fuses don't all burn the same way, and the powder doesn't always lay in the same way, and when it burns, the powder burns explosively, and when it does, that kind of mixes it up while it's burning, and it burns a little more to this side, to that side. The ball has to be smaller than the bore of the barrel because otherwise the ball wouldn't uh, you know, roll in and roll back out again. So there's, a, there's room around the ball for the uh, gases to escape. The ball is not really a sphere. You can't make a perfect sphere. And the gun, the barrel isn't really cylindrical. It's not really straight because this is a real thing. There's always little bumps and crevices and scratches. The ball is always a little oblong on this side or the other. So there's a lot of unique differences in every ball and every cannon. And every time you fire that cannon, those unique differences change. Because once a ball rolls out of it and you've blown up gunpowder in it, it's different now than it was. It's not exactly the same cannon anymore, you see. So the nature of the problem deterministically is that you have to model this. If you're going to model it accurately, so you really know where that cannonball is going to land, you have to model it at the molecular and at the atomic level. You have to know what's going on in the atoms and molecules of the gas, of the gunpowder, of the, of the barrel of the gun and the cannonball. Because how that comes out is a very difficult problem to calculate. It probably would take, if you did it at that level of detail, so you really want an accurate answer, it would probably take a supercomputer hours, if not weeks, if not months, just to calculate that one cannonball coming out of the, of the cannon. Okay, it takes that long. It's a very, very hard problem to deal with, you know, however many of billions of molecules and energy and how it moves and how it propagates behind that cannonball and what gas escapes from this side, which makes the ball spin a little that way. And all of that has a very uh, noticeable difference on where the ball lands. Okay, so that's the, that's the um, deterministic way. And actually, when the ball clears the barrel, now you have to worry about Air pressure, changes in air pressure. Air pressure changes as you go up and down. Temperature changes as you go up and down. Density of the air changes as you go up and down. Balls that are lopsided don't fly the same way that balls that are perfect spheres. And one lopsided this way flies different, one lopsided that way. Besides that, there's wind. Little pressure differences just locally in the air. So you have all this stuff to take care of. Now we have to do most of the molecules in the air as well in this deterministic solution. See how hard that is? 
It's really a, a, a very hard problem. What, how we model this thing probabilistically is we take a cannon, we fire it a hundred times, we go out and look where the dents are made in the ground where the balls landed, we come up with a probability distribution of where they landed, what the probability is that it would hit in any particular place, maybe you have to fire a thousand balls. We fire as many as we need to make a good what's called dispersion pattern of the uh, it's ballistic dispersion. And that dispersion is made by all these little tiny differences inside the barrel and the little differences in the atmosphere. So we go out there and that doesn't take us very long and we end up with a probability distribution. Now, if we want to calculate where a cannonball goes, okay, bang, the deterministic computer starts cranking and maybe next month it'll get the answer. We reach up with a random draw from the probability distribution and say, answer, done. All right, a microsecond in computer time versus weeks of supercomputers. So there's a really big difference. And now, where did we get that data? Okay, for us here physically, we'd have to go out and get this cannon and fire it. And you know, every time you fire it, like I say, it changes it. So that dispersion pattern would change with time. So we'd have to fire a bunch of cannons to get the data. And mostly for scientists and engineers these days, that's just a lot of trouble. But now, that stuff all works out according to the rule set, doesn't it? It's the rule set in this virtual reality is what they're trying to calculate with all that detail. Well, who owns the rule set? Well, how's your consciousness system? How hard is it for them to go out and get that data? For them to model that cannon exactly as they have modeled it in the virtual simulation. I mean, they've got it, right? They've got all the information, all the data's right there. So they can fire a million of those shots under every condition imaginable, come out with really tight statistics and that may take them a while because they've got a lot of detailed modeling to do, but they only have to do it once. When they do it once, they're done. Now, anytime one of those balls is fired, all they have to do is say, well, how many have been fired? You know, which gun barrel did da 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 da. They go through the list, they go to the lookup table, they take a, a random draw from that distribution, millisecond, got the answer. See? And now they can do that forevermore because they've got the data on that kind of a thing. Well, they're the ones that created that thing in the virtual reality that got all the data. So why would you want to calculate everything from the ground up through a laborious calculation every single time when you've got all the data to do it simply? Of course you wouldn't. So the idea of a, of a uh, deterministic simulation is just really bad design and really poor, um, you know, uh, poor planning if you're running a virtual reality. So that's, that's kind of what I talk about when I talk about a probabilistic uh, uh, probability. So the, the larger consciousness system is set up to be able to create the probability distributions that are just as accurate as they'd like to have them. Now, that's another good example is that it doesn't have to use probability distributions that are any more precise than what that situation calls for. If the situation calls for, I want to know where that cannonball lands to the nearest you know, half a millimeter, well, then you need very precise probability distributions. But if it's, you're in the middle of a war and there's 10,000 cannons and they're all blown up at once, Nobody knows where any of those cannonballs land. You know, they land where they land. It goes boom and the thing lands someplace and does whatever damage it does. And now a very, very simple probability distribution will work that out just fine. Because after all, the people running around in this war are virtual bodies in a virtual simulation and it all works really well. So that's the, that's the basic difference there. Okay, so both of them both the probabilistic model and the deterministic model are based on the rule set. It's just in a deterministic model, you have to go from the bottom up every single instance and compute it new all over again because in the real world, everything changes. So every time a cannon is fired anywhere, you have to start with the molecules and the atoms in the cannon and work that problem out, which is almost impossible to do. And even if it were possible, even if you had a computer of such speed that you could do it, it would be such a waste 
of computer resources and such a waste of time. Why would you want to compute all that when the probabilistic will give you the, an answer that's just as good, if not better. It's better because it can be adjusted in its, in its uh, fidelity to whatever it is you want. It doesn't have to waste cycles giving you more fidelity than you really need, you see. So they're both based on the rule set, but one is just much more efficient than the other. Okay, well then this gets down to a comparison of the, <clears throat> of the bottom up versus, versus the top down. By bottom up, I mean the particles build up the reality from the bottom up. Things get more complex as you go up. The top down is you have the probability of how the reality works, okay? And then that then generates the change in the data stream, which informs our reality of, of what's going on. Okay, well there's four main issues here that I'd just like to mention. One is that the bottoms up uh, starts with elementary particles. Okay, these are elementary particles that they're called fundamental particles. There's a problem number one is with elementary particles. An elementary particle isn't composed of anything. Okay, if it's truly fundamental, it doesn't have any piece parts. So you know, we used to think that about the atom. Then the atom had a nucleus and it had electrons. And we used to think that about the electron and how the electron has quartz. And then the nucleus has protons and neutrons. And now the protons and neutrons get broken apart. And everything that used to be elementary becomes complex and there's something else that's elementary. So now we have this set of elementary particles that we call elementary and they're fundamental. But the problem is if it's elementary and it has no piece parts, how do you get it? Where does it come from? You see, it's not made from anything. It's got no piece parts. So there's no way to make one. No way to make one. How do you get it? Mm, you know. Well, they just are. They are because they are, is the answer. It exists because they exist. And if you want to, if you want to cheat this a little bit, you'd say, well, they happened in the Big Bang somehow. They just got made, but how do you make something again with no piece parts? You know, where did they come from? And besides that, the Big Bang, all right, let's even give you that. Where did the Big Bang come from? See, it's the same problem. Popped out of nowhere, just is. So your elementary particles that this whole reality is built on just popped out of nowhere. That doesn't give you a real warm feeling, right, about the results that you're going to get from this, from this calculation. So they're elementary and they're, they're fundamental. Okay, now that they're fundamental also has a problem. And that problem is that none of these particles have ever been observed or measured. None of them have ever been observed or measured. What has been observed or measured are the effects of these particles, right? So we see an effect, like the gravity was an effect. Things fall down, that's an effect, right? Now let's explain that effect. Well, maybe it's that masses attract. Maybe it's curvature space-time. Maybe it's electromagnetic. See, that's different. So the particle is just a hypothetical model of what somebody dreamed up to tell you how the effect works. So these are models. They're hypothetical particles. So one, they're elementary, which makes it difficult to where they come from. Secondly, they're fundamental, which means they're just uh, theories. They're just hypothetical. Nobody's ever seen one. Nobody's ever measured one. We make them up to solve the problem of why do we get this effect? Like the masses attract, we make that up to solve where do we get this gravity effect or the curve space-time. That just gets made up to say where do we get this gravity effect, you see? And there's often multiple ways that you can describe something, right? You get different viewpoints, different ways of describing all kinds of things. So we describe it with particles. And the fact is, back in the early 1900s when quantum mechanics was just getting started, they had a big argument among physicists at that time. And the argument was, we have a perfectly good probabilistic model here that could explain all this. And that was um, Niels Bohr, Copenhagen, said that. And the other physicists said, well, but that's kind of weird, you know, probability. I mean, we're used to Newton and these little particles and everything's mass and we understand that real good. We don't like that. It's too weird. We like particles. 
So at that point, back in the early 1900s, a decision was made to go with the particles because that feels better to us because science has always been committed to materialism and there you are with the particles. So a decision was made to go with the particles and they have and that's been, they've been down that rabbit hole you know, ever since, since the early 1900s. Uh, so that's why they're having so many problems now trying to say, well, how does a double slit experiment work? You know, why do particles act like that? Well, it's because particle was a wrong way to model the problem. It's not a good model to explain the effects. You see, so it falls down. So we say these fundamental particles are hypothetical particles. And they're elementary, which means they pop out of nothing. So we see materialism now doesn't have exactly a real strong, you know, logical foundation underneath of it. It's starting to look pretty, pretty ratty at the roots. The third problem is that consciousness exists. Of course, the, the, the materialists may deny that, that it exists, but I think most everybody, you know, knows that, that we are conscious and we make decisions and we could make this decision or that decision and events will change based on the decisions we make and that seems pretty obvious to most of us. But in any case, they, they want to show how that could happen out of particles, but they can't. Not only they can't, they can't even come up with a good model of how that could possibly work. How do you put the Legos together to build this real complex Lego thing and then it becomes conscious because of the Legos? See, that just doesn't fly very well. It's not rational. So they call that the hard problem. And if you Google consciousness studies, you'll find the hard problem. The hard problem is how do you take a bunch of inanimate chunks of particles and end up with consciousness? No ideas. If they had an idea, you know, they jump on it, but there's just no way to connect those two. So that's the third problem. Things like consciousness now disappear. The fourth problem is the, is the complexity and the processing requirements to work a materialistic model. Everything, every action has to be computed from the ground up every time because it's different. So I raise my arm and I put it down whole bunch of molecules and atoms just went you know, through a whole lot of motions that would take a supercomputer days to compute. And I do it again, and guess what? It didn't go in exactly the same place it did last time. It all has to be computed from the ground up again. So I keep doing this, and I keep driving that supercomputer crazy because it can't keep up, you see? So why would you go through all of that computation if you didn't have to? So it's inefficient. You know, and we have a thing in science called Occam's Razor, which says if processes really don't make any sense, if they're not efficient, if they're not bear, pared down to the simplest way that you could solve the problem, they're probably wrong. And you apply Occam's Razor to that, and it would toss determinism out in a second because it's so complicated to build a world out of particles. So those are four things that uh, just don't add up. And that's the foundation under which all the rest of science is based, you see? That's the basic foundation. So uh, these elementary fundamental particles um, aren't too solid logically. And it's a very good guess, I'll say another one of these things that is uh, um, falsifiable, when they have the tools to tear these elementary fundamental particles apart, they will find more elementary fundamental particles. And the old ones then will be complex particles and they'll have new fundamental particles that popped out of nowhere. So that's a prediction of mine. And the reason I say that is that the way the reality works is that if you have something and you don't know what's inside and you break it apart, the larger consciousness system takes a random draw from a probability, probability distribution of what might be in there and that's what you're going to see. And of course, it also has to be consistent with what we know, with everything else that we know. And that's what you're going to see. Now, eventually, you'll get down to the bottom of the resolution of the virtual reality. And then you're stuck. You're not going to break that apart. So we do end up with something that's fundamental. And we'd say, aha, when we get to the end, there's something that pops out of nothing. No, it doesn't have to pop out of nothing. You're stuck with pops out of nothing if you're a materialist. If you 
you know, are doing a, a, a probabilistic virtual reality, it's simply the initial conditions. How big is delta t? How big is delta x? You know, what are the what are the initial conditions that you put when you when you do this? What are the limits of your simulation? Well, that's the bottom. Doesn't have to pop out of nothing. That's a it's an initial condition. It's simply explained. But where we're measuring now, even our tiniest little particle, even our, the little Higgs they just uh, they just found, we're so excited about. That is a long, long way from hitting the limits of resolution. They have orders and orders and orders of magnitude to go before they get down to our resolution of this virtual reality, down to the Planck length and the Planck time. So what's the probability that they're, what they've hit on now is fundamental? Very, very, very small probability. When they tear that apart, there's going to be something else. And then when they find they can tear that something else apart, there's going to be something else because they've got like 20 orders of magnitude to go before they hit the bottom of the stack. So they're neither elementary nor fundamental. And uh, it's a crazy way to run a reality. All right. So generation of our PMR. PMR for the newbies is physical matter reality. That's our universe we live in. Okay, the first five of these are just for background. The first five basically explain how the larger consciousness system started, and, and uh, we get down to the, like the sixth bullet, the new, new facts enter, you know, physical reality by a random draw from a probability distribution of those possibilities that are consistent with all former PMR facts. Once new facts exist in the physical world, they join the set of former PMR facts as long as their defining information is available in the physical reality. So that's it. So we're not, we don't have to build a whole lot of things up out of, out of little things. All we have to do is create the probability distributions, run the problem, model the rule set once, get the probability distributions, and a lot of things that happen on this planet, like me just putting my arm up in the air and taking it down, you don't have to do new probability distribution for that. If it went up and was a little, was a millimeter this way instead of that way, you don't notice, nor do you care. You see, so we don't have to do that to the, to the atoms and molecules and things. It just, you get a point where it's good enough. So anyway, that's really uh, all there is to it. So with top-down logic, first we start with the assumption of fundamental consciousness, and uh, we allow the process of evolution to step by step logically derive everything else. It's just that simple. Okay, now this one, I don't want that to scare you. This really won't hurt. I want to explain to you what it means to say take a random draw from the probability distribution because you hear me say that over and over again and most of you th probably think that there's a bunch of possibilities out there and you randomly just reach up and grab one. That's not what's going on at all. In that case, every possibility would have the same likelihood of being drawn. It doesn't. That's why we have the probability distribution. So hopefully you can see this. Who are the people who can't see this? Is it too light or too small or whatever? Can people see it? Can they see it all right? OK, good. Then uh, we have 26 possibilities here. 26 possibilities, so from A to Z. A is a possibility, B is a possibility, C, okay, 26 different possibilities that could happen. Now, this is a probability distribution. This line goes up here and here and here and so on and back down, and that's the probability distribution. And many of you think of probability distributions as either being uniform, which all of the possibilities have the same probability, or and a Gaussian, which is the bell curve. You know, it starts low, goes up, and comes down. Well, those are the nice, neat, easy things to work with that we do, but real probability distributions that describe the, the, whole, the real world can be any kind of ugly thing. It doesn't have to be something nice and pretty or symmetric. So this one I just made up, and that means that there's one A here, that's what the one is. There's two B here, that's what the two, and so on. There's six H's here, and that's the six. So each one of these letters has a probability that's represented by the number of those letters that are in here, okay? So what a probability distribution is, it gives you the relative probability 
between the different possibilities. So this 25, these Ks, is 25 times more likely, more probable, than this D or E, which is one, okay? And, uh, you know, the uh, L, look at the L. It's seven times more probable than, say, the G, because here's the L, and it's a 21, and here's the, the uh, G at three. So it's seven times more probable than the G. So you see, it's just simple uh, arithmetic there. So this is a probability distribution. Now here's what it means to take a random draw from the probability distribution. You take all these letters. Now all these letters turns out to be there's 165 letters under this distribution. Okay, so I mean that's one plus two plus two plus one plus one plus two plus three plus six and just keep doing that all the way there to count all the letters and you get 165 letters. I'm sure somebody's gonna count them and see if I did it right, but anyway. That's what it is. So here's what you do, is you take all 165 letters, you put them in a box, you shake them up, turn the box upside down, shake it again, reach in, random draw, pull one out, and that's the possibility that happens. That's the one you get. Well, you see they're all not likely. The same, I mean, they're all not as likely as each other. You know, the Z and the D and the E, very likely out of 165, you're going to pull one of those out. You could, but it's just unlikely. You're most likely to pull out a K, because there's 25 of those in there, you see? That's what I mean. So you, you take a, a random draw on the distribution, means that you pull things out according to the probability. Now, of course, when we do math, for those of you out here doing math, he's thinking, what is it? Why does that stack of Ks up there? What do you mean you put them in a box? You know, this doesn't sound too scientific, right? Putting things in a box. But it makes it easier for me to explain it to you. What's really going on in there is that you take all the probabilities. Here's one way to look at it. There's several ways, mathematically. You take all the probabilities, you find the smallest one. Okay, you multiply the smallest one by a number that's the inverse of that probability. So when you multiply something times inverse, you get one. So if that smallest m number is one over a thousand, then you multiply it by a thousand, you get one. Then you multiply every other probability in the set by a thousand. Now you've normalized them all, and you end up with a distribution like this. And now you can just add up all the numbers of all the probabilities, and that's what you divide by instead of the 165. So see, that's kind of mathy. You know, putting them in a box is easy to understand. And then if you want to go to the next level, each one of these little towers here of letters represents a certain amount of area under the curve. And you use integral calculus to measure the area under the curve of the various things. And then the total area under the whole curve is the total, is what you divide by. So there's just, you know, there are actual ways that mathematicians do this without putting little slips of paper into boxes and shaking them upside down and pulling out things. But that's a good metaphor that you can use for what it means to randomly pull something out of a distribution. So that's the point. And I can show you some of the probabilities here. So the, the Ks are 25 divided by 165. That's their probability. You see? So it's always going to be less than one because you're taking the area under the curve in a little piece divided by the area under the whole curve. So it's always, probabilities always have to be less than one. So what's the probability that you'd get any one of these letters from A to Z? One, because you'd take all the area under the curve and divide it by all the area under the curve, and if you reach in the box, you will pull out a letter. So the probability of getting one of the letters is one. You see, the probability of getting any particular letter depends on the relative probabilities between the letters. Anyway, I think I probably ran that one into the ground. But I thought you'd want to know. All right. So now we're up to the end of a, of a top level, a top level uh, comparison. Uh, we have the, we're going to kind of compare the, the particles and materialism to the top down logic of uh, consciousness and virtual reality. So I don't know if you can read that. It's awful small. Unfortunately, we could not expand this to take up the whole screen. It didn't work that way. We don't have control over the projector. No, that didn't work. But you'll notice one thing is that both of them have the word somehow in it. I tried to emphasize that. Here's the, 
Here's the somehow here, uh, right there. Okay, and this one has a somehow in it down here too someplace. They both have that because they both have to start on an assumption. So we don't penalize the deterministic way or the material way because they start with an assumption. We start with an assumption because there's limits on knowledge and we can't know everything. So an assumption is not a failure of process, it's just a fact of life. We start with an assumption, so they both do. But after that, and the assumptions they make are very different, okay? So, you know, in the, in the uh, bottoms up, we start with the assumption that the micro world of 61 theoretical particles based on 19 arbitrary constants, those arbitrary constants were just made up so that the description of the particle would fit the measurement that was made. So that's the way it is. You make a particle, but a particle doesn't work so well, then, you know, we used to call that fudge factor. You know, you'd, you'd, you'd multiply what you got by a number you needed to get the right answer. You know, that was a fudge factor, but it kind of works like that. You get these particles, and in order to make them fit what you want, you multiply them by constants to shift them around and make them fit the theory. Instead of making the theory fit the, you know, they do it the other way around. So the 61 theoretical particles, 19 arbitrary constants, I just pulled that out of uh, Wikipedia. Um, that they somehow exist without a source, without a cause, without explanation. And then we construct the physical world from these hypothetical particle models. And somehow a mysterious process we don't understand creates consciousness. Thus, we come up with a bottoms-up worldview that can explain a limited set of facts about the physical world. Now the top-down logic is we start with the assumption of fundamental consciousness that somehow, you know, emerges from random process into complexity. But now that's not pops out of nowhere. That's a process given credibility with mathematics. We can show how this can happen, you know, what that, uh, how that might work. But we, it's still, we start with the assumption. Um, then, we allow the process of evolution to logically explain the physical, metaphysical, philosophical, and theological facts of the larger reality, including explaining much PMR experimental data that cannot be explained by the bottoms-up approach. Thus, we come up with a top-down approach that explains the larger reality, our universe, and its mechanics, its purpose, its function. Additionally, it explains our individual and collective connection and responsibility to that larger reality and to each other. So the top-down approach generates a logical and scientific foundation under the wisdom collected and refined over thousands of years of human subjective experience, as well as contains all of contemporary physical science as a subset. So that's kind of the comparison between these two ways of, of uh, approaching the nature of reality, and that is all of the upfront material that I wanted to present. Now it'll become more fun. Now we get to just talk and see what you are interested in and, and issues that you might have and questions you might want to ask. Again, let me iterate, there is, no, there is no inappropriate or bad question. If it's an honest question, it's a good question. Um, I have a couple of questions about the probability distribution. If you have an event that, say you have uh, a snake that the venom is so potent that it's a hundred percent kill rate mm -hmm. and there's always some weird thing of somebody you know sometime lives how does the probability distribution look on an event like that okay it's um, yeah that's very similar to uh, in science what we call tunneling is a, is a similar sort of thing the way it looks is, is that you have this probability of dying from this snake bite <laughs> And that is this big part of the curve up here. But then there's this other part of the curve that goes way out here and there's a, there is some probability that you'll live. Now the probability that you'll live is this example I did. You know, I had a couple of ones, right? They were one out of you know, 165. Well, it may have been one out of you know, 100,000. There's still, when you go into that distribution and shake the, the letters up in the box, when you pick one, you can pick that number one, that, you know, that, that thing that was at the bottom of the list as far as likelihood right. may happen. Right. But it's not going to happen often because a random draw will most likely pull out the one that says the venom's you know, fatal. 
So that's the way that works. In science, we have a thing called tunneling. And what we do is we take particles, like electrons or something, and we put them in a, what in science we call a potential whale. That means we surround them, say, with an electromagnetic field that they can't get through. If they get close to it, it repels them. So whatever side of the jar you know, that they're in, they get close to it, pushes them back. That's a potential whale. And the probability that they can somehow get through that force field and get out of that box is like one in a million. One in a million. Well, it doesn't happen very often. But when it does happen is when you have 10 billion particles in the jar. Because these are very small particles, and it's easy to get 10 billion, you know, electrons in a jar because that's still a little bit of nothing. See, we have billions and billions of cells in our body, right? So we have to deal with really high numbers. And once you have a lot of particles in the jar, particles are popping out of that jar all the time. There's a stream of them, they're just pouring out of the jar like the jar had a hole in it. But it's only one in a million that any one of them is like that. But one in a million, when you're talking about a billion, there's thousands of particles coming out and we actually have electronic components that use that. We use that trickle charge coming out from a, it's a it's tunneling diode and most of your electronic equipment will have tunneling diodes in it where we depend on that you know that low probability that one in a million probability being pulled out some of the time not most of the time so that's the same way that's why that happens where there's something that is very improbable but it, you get over it and that's why sometimes people who are only given a few months to live turn around and you know, walk out of the hospital the next day and they're perfectly fine. They, they uh, you know, they pulled out a, a, good, a good number, a good distribution. Okay, if you put up that probability chart again and you add intent, then mm -hmm. what happens? What happens is that it changes. So let's say that we have an intent that the D and E that had one have a higher probability than that. Well, what we'd see is that that, that lump over D, over D and E was a, little, was a little lump there, not much. That lump would start to grow. And the, the relative probabilities now to that would start, the big hump would start to come down. And we might be able to make the big hump that was in the middle go down pretty low and the little hump on the side go up to where I was more probable. But we may just go that far. In which case, this is still more probable, right. but this is more Poss likely more than it used to be. Yeah, right. it's more possible. So those prob but the probability distributions are, are affected by our intent. Our intent moves them around. It's a built-in part of the system to give us feedback. This is a schoolhouse for you know, individuated units of consciousness to grow up. And in a schoolhouse, you need feedback. You need to see the results of your intent. Your intent is an expression of your quality. It's an extension of, it's an expression of your uh, being level. So when you have an intent, you modify what's likely to happen in the probable future. It's more likely to happen if you have an intent for it to happen. It's less likely to happen if you have an intent for it not to happen. So you can change these probabilities around and make things happen or not happen in the world with different probabilities. And you may only be choosing them that much, which means what you wanted to happen still doesn't happen, but you've modified the probabilities. Yes, you have modified the probabilities. Even if you don't get a result, you just haven't modified them enough. That's why you know, Raymond asked for maybe a group thing. Right. Because if you get you know, 60 people all sending an intent, that can have a much more powerful effect than one person sending an intent. So. That's why, that's why that works that way. It's just part of the system. We're co-creators with the larger consciousness system. Now, on the other hand, it's not just you tugging at that probability distribution. There may be another hundred or thousand people tugging at that same distribution. You want it to go this way and they want it to go that way. And then it's just, it averages over the, you know, over all of that. So if you get you know, more energy is pushing it up than there is pulling it down, it goes up. So that's, the, that's kind of the nature of it. That's why when, you know, we have the, like the mob mentality. You know, you get a bunch of people together who are angry, and even though all of them independently are reasonably intelligent people, you know, they all act like idiots when they're, when they're in this group. 
you know, because the anger comes out and they all sink down to that level. Well, it's part of what's going on there is that the probability starts, you know, of them doing something intelligent together starts to come down because they're angry. And it's that negative intent that starts pulling that down, have all that negative intent. And when you get around people like all of us who are just the opposite, you know, full of love and peace and, and uh, you know, good, good intentions, we'll leave this group by the end of the day and we'll be energized. It'll be neat, all these people in here because we all pull each other up. We all kind of feel this energy and, and uh, that's because there's a lot of positiveness and somebody else's positiveness helps make you positive and your positiveness helps make them positive and we all kind of feel, feel better and we can do more, ask better questions, understand better just because we're here in a group than if we were sitting alone watching the YouTube. See, there's an advantage in being here in person because you get part of that group intent and we have a bunch of people all thinking similar kind of thoughts, all kind of on the same wavelength and the same subject here and that makes a big difference than if you're sitting in your you know, desk looking at a computer doing uh, a YouTube video. That's the, you know, that's so the main difference. When you're talking about randomness, you're talking about the probability distribution, and the probability distribution is what's possible within the rule set of the VR. Right. Okay. It's what's possible and what does not conflict with what's gone before. So you can't have things that just basically, you know, create a, uh, you know, a, a problem here. They just, they're not, they don't connect up with what's been before. So we need that. We need consistency in the reality. But other than that, there's lots of possibilities. And other than that, some are more probable than others. And our intent can change that probability. And what, when it comes, comes time to actually take a measurement, which is, means something from the larger conscious system gets put in our data stream. We're gonna, you know, the whole reality is really in our heads. It's in, the, it's in the data stream, the consciousness. So when that gets put there, then that then becomes a fact in our shared reality. And what that fact is, is a random draw from the probability distribution. It's not just a random selection of some possibility, but a, a random draw from a probability distribution. Now sometimes that probability distribution is like a zero and a one. You know, here it could either be this way or that way, and the probability that it's that way is one. That's what happens in the double slit experiment when you measure the which way data. Which, which slit did the, did the particle go through? You measure it's in this it's right here. Well, when you measure that it went through the slit, when it gets to the screen and we take the measurement of, well, what happens on the screen is a probability of one. See, because it's, it's been located there, it's going in this direction, it's gonna hit the screen right behind the slit. So at that point, you've got a probability of one that's gonna do that and a probability of zero that'll do anything else. And then you throw away all that data and you don't have it anymore. Now what's the probability? Well, it's not one anymore, you see? because the data isn't there anymore. And uh, what happens then is you get to the default, and that is it's just probability. The probability kind of interacts and gives you a diffraction pattern. So it's, you have different probabilities and they change. Every time you do something, you modify the probability distribution. So that's the, and that's a, that's a feature of the system to give us feedback so that we can see whether our intents that we're having, that our intent is what motivates us. What we do and what we say expresses our intent. So we can see that what we do and what we say, what's it doing? You know, what's it doing to our results? And we can see that personally in we're cheerful and happy and positive and our life tends to be that way. We're curmudgeons and negative and angry and our life tends to be that way. And we can see it in the, in the ensemble, in the group, when we read the news and, and whatever, and we see, well, what's the average going on here? You know, what are we doing collectively? Well, it's war and famine and, you know, greed and all this kind of stuff. Well, that's us, collectively. Individually, it's a different picture. But we all are, you know, and, and by collectively, again, we have a lot of different people, some pushing up, some pushing down on the same thing. You know, some people want peace, some people want war. And it depends collectively how that gets pushed as to what we'll do. 
what the probabilities are because when somebody has to make a decision since something actually has to happen then we'll take that draw out of the out of the probability distribution and that's the way it'll go when when you're actually going to bring a new fact into the world then that's what will happen people will make the decisions and they'll go based on all of that that's why cultures are so important because you have a tendency to share the biases of your culture for just for that reason because you're in amongst a whole lot of people who have certain biases and you tend to share those biases and if you don't share those biases you're a fish out of water you're trying to swim upstream you know and it's hard you know so that's that's why those things work the way they the way they work you mentioned about probabilities interacting in regards to the slit experiment and I'm, I'm sort of curious if you could you know talk about that a bit more how do you get interactions between multiple probabilities are they all being computed and averaged out or sort of what is the mechanism by which probabilities do interact for instance in the slit experiments so that you get a diffraction pattern um, also another question if I can, I'll do both of them at once and then shut up if you talked earlier about the speed of light and and particles or things moving either at the speed of light or at zero mm -hmm. so you're talking about a velocity is that an absolute velocity or is that a relative velocity vis-a-vis -vis Einstein? I was talking about speed not velocity because direction is just another component uh, you give a speed in a direction you have a velocity speed in a particular direction is called velocity but just speed as a scalar okay. value is, is just speed um, try to answer um, both of those first with the double the double slit how how is a probability combined computed you have probability coming toward the slits right no measurements have been taken and you have a probability of a particle being somewhere so where is that particle well it could be over here it could be over here just like in the in the uh, potential well you know it could be outside the well it could be inside the well so it's got probability and mathematically that goes all the way out to infinity on both sides you know and lumps up in the middle somewhere around where you think the particle is so that probability comes up to the slit and the probability distribution is this big and the slits are here and here so the probability distribution covers both the slits it could be here it could be there could be neither one it could be off to the side you know it could be any of these places because you're firing out these these uh, particles you know lots of them it's hard to fire just one particle though they they can do that but they're firing lots of them in a, in a row mm -hmm. So the probability covers both slits. That means it has a probability of going through either. So now the system has a problem. Does it have to pick one at that spot or not? Well, no, because there's no measurement being made. It doesn't pick a probability until you're creating a fact in this physical reality, until the, measure, until the measurement's made. Until somebody asks for the measurement, there is no need to come up with an answer you see this is the big difference between a kind of a deterministic view and a probabilistic view in a deterministic view you have to make a decision reality has to go through one or the other right it's, that's the particle view it can't go through both it has to go through one or the other decision is made just by the facts you know the physics makes the decision well you know in the in the probabilistic world it doesn't work that way they could probably miss or go through either one and unless a measurement's made unless somebody makes a measurement then nothing's computed there's nothing to do we only get computations put in our data stream that give us information see this virtual reality doesn't really exist just like when you're playing world of warcraft there's not actually a bunch of little elves and, and other kinds of monsters running around someplace you see they don't really exist they only exist on your computer screen. They only exist in your consciousness. That's the thing. Well, now we're the consciousness. We're, our consciousness is the computer screen. And we're getting data, and we're interpreting that data. You see? So the probability gets there. It doesn't have to pick a pick in a probabilistic world. It's just probability, because nobody's asking the question, is the particle here? If they ask the question, is the particle here, by making a measurement here to see if there's a particle there, then something will have to be given to them, a one or a zero, a yes or a no. 
Mm. Right? And at that point, you go into the distribution, you take a random poll, and you decide whether it's a yes or a no. There's a particle there. Well, if nobody's asking the question, why would the system give yeses and nos and yeses and nos and the particles here and there? It's just probability. You see, so the particle doesn't actually exist any more than we exist. It's an information system, and the information is either given to someone, which makes it into this reality in a data stream, or it's not. And it has, it's a multiplayer game, so we need consistency. So when the probability gets these two slits, it's still probability. And how does the probability combine? Well, it has to combine in a way that is consistent with what we measure, what we've measured before in the past, which means the way it combines is just like it would combine if it were water waves or any other kind of wave approaching two slits which means it's, it's a, called a circular function, it's a trig function that says how much of the probability goes here and here and here and here based on the angles and, the, and what it does then is say that, that uh, where they overlap and the, and the waves are in phase, that's the wave being in phase, think of it as a probability wave. So when the waves are in phase, then the probabilities add together of being there and you have a big hump in the probability distribution. And where the waves cancel, you have a negative in the prob you have a zero in the probability distribution. There's a zero probability of being there because the waves canceled out. These are probability waves. They're not anything really waving. It's just probability. So now we take a look at the screen. Okay, the screen was a piece of film. So somebody takes the film out, develops it, and looks at the film. And when they look at the film, the larger conscious system has to tell them what they're going to see because that's what it does. When you turn on your screen and you go over and you look at your elf, the computer gives you a picture of your elf and what your elf is doing, you see? And if you look to the west, you see the mountains. You look to the east, you see the tree and the river because that's what the server you know, has in, in the map. That's what's consistent with their map. So now you get to the screen, you look at the result, and it's not until you look at that result that the system actually produces an answer. There is no answer on that screen until somebody looks at it. You see, a materialist would say there has to be an answer on that screen because you know the particles have been doing, the answer has been building up on that screen all along. And they're there because they have this materialistic view of the world. But there is no answer on that screen until you look at it because there's no reason for the, for in a virtual probable reality, for the system to produce any object in this reality if there's no player demanding it. Mm -hmm. When all the players go home in World of Warcraft, the, you know, the, the server isn't running the little elves around you know, and, and playing the game and making the trees and growing the grass and doing all that just for fun because it likes doing it. It only does it when a player comes on. When a player comes on, it sends data to that player. If that player doesn't look east, it doesn't send what's east to that player. Mm -hmm. It's only when that player looks east that that player gets data that describes what's east. It's only when somebody looks at that plate, at the back of you know, the, the screen in a double slit experiment, that somebody gets data that tells them what's on that screen. Before that point, nothing's on that screen. The screen, what's on it, is still just probability. You see, so once you understand that, then the eraser experiment doesn't get to be, you know, isn't that surprising. In the eraser experiment, the, what surprised people still surprises people and still makes them, you know, physicists, uh, you know, roll eyes and say they have no idea what's going on here. And you have Feynman saying, you know, if we ever understood the double slit, we'd understand all the quantum mechanics. That's the key. Well, what, they, what surprised them so much is they ran the experiment, they took the measurements at the slits, they had the data, a oh, particle went through this slit, particle went through that slit. They erased the data before anybody yes. looked at the data. They collected it but didn't look at it, so they don't really know. They erased it, and then they go look at the slit later, you know, go yeah. look at the screen later on. Yeah. Well, now here they've been firing particles. Some of them went through those slits. Some of them, they measured. They looked at it and said, oh, look, my counter's going count, 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 count. They're going through this slit. They're going through that slit. And then... They erase the data, they come and look at the screen at the end, and it's a diffraction pattern. You see, how did that happen? How did somebody go in and erase those two wads of particles behind each slit and put a diffraction pattern there? Well, those two wads behind each slit never existed. Nothing existed. It was all just potential. It was all just 
probability, and when they erased the data, the probability distribution changed. You see? And probability distribution can change right up to the point that it becomes a fact in this reality frame. So that's what's going on there, and that's why it was such a big mystery, and still is such a big mystery, is that if you're a materialist, something happened that's impossible. You took data, and somehow the data changed itself after you took it, and that's impossible because particles can't do that, you see? So now we have a, an experiment that says, guys, this is not a bottoms-up particle <laughs> reality. It doesn't work that way. Look. Look at the results, you see? And they, of course, look at that and they say, well, see, that was weird. Nobody understands that, probably never will. Let's go on, study our particles. You see, they don't, they, they don't see that as well, they used to. You know, back in the early days of quantum mechanics, it was, wow, and now it's like just weird stuff. You know, shut up and calculate, you know, it's that sort of attitude. So that's what's going on and that's how the probabilities are still probabilities even after they've gone through the slit, it's still probable. After the experiment's done, a year later, and you bring out that, that screen data and look at it, there's still nothing on that screen because nobody's looked at it yet. A year's gone by, screen's still blank, you see? And then somebody opens up and looks at it and now the system has to provide you with data. The person that looks at it is going to get some data because that's the way it works. If you look east, you see the mountains in the east, you know. You look west, you see the trees. That's, that's the way the map works. So when you look at that screen, the system says, okay, we've got to give this guy some data. He just took a look at what's inside, what's on this film. In comes the data, and what you get is when you take that random draw out of the probability of what might be there. Well, there's no more which way data. That's gone. That got erased. So why should the system display something that, has, that doesn't have to? It is, you get the default, which is the, uh, the distribution. So it's a fundamental problem with the way science sees reality is why they can't understand that experiment. If they had the right um, concept, then the way the experiment works is logical. It's just simple logic. So what, what I find sort of curious is that if you looked at a probability distribution and you haven't actually rendered the event, but it, it seemed like just writing an algorithm for reality, you could say, well, I'll choose if it goes through one slit or the other slit. That's the probability distribution. But instead, it seems like it's adding up the probability distributions of it going through each slit and coming up with a composite function. Yeah. Well, the way it does that is, like I say, it, it looks at it as a, it looks of it looks at it when it's combining the probability functions as a wave. Why? Because we've already sent waves through slits for hundreds of years and we know, not hundreds of years, but for, you know, for years and years people put wave through slits and they see the diffraction pattern. That was old science when this was being done. So now it's not going to do something that contradicts the old science. It's not going to go and become a checkered pattern or, uh, you know, polka dots or something really different. It's going to have to be consistent with reality. So it has to combine, in the set, mathematically, it combines the same way waves combine, which is a superposition of, of waves. And in this case, it's you know, probability waves instead of water waves. But it works the same way and gives you the same diffraction pattern as it does with, with water waves. So in a sense, we've, we've created our science by how we did the original experiments. Sure, exactly. We do. It's what we, you know, and I give the example of the, of the, um, you know, the, the scientist that's, that's looking in outer space, because outer space is one of the places where there's a lot of stuff we've never seen before, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of unknowns about outer space, so it makes a good example. It's not that there's something out there, and the scientist gets the brand new telescope that sees further than anyone's seen before, so he looks into this area, and he sees something. He sees what's out there. That's a materialistic view. There's nothing out there. This is a virtual reality. He looks at his telescope, he looks into this area of space, and there's a hundred things that could be out there. And they're still consistent with everything we've known from before. That's important. And there's a probability distribution among those things, and maybe a dozen of them have equal probability. You know, it could be all sorts of things, and it may be not a lot of restrictions on it because we don't know a whole lot about 
what's in that area. Okay, a random draw from the probability distribution among those possibilities drops one out and that's what he sees in his telescope. So if we had what we'd seen before influences what we can see in the future because it produces constraints, right? The fact that we saw water waves go through two slits, now we have a constraint on what can happen you know, with two slits when other things go through it. So the probability system has to deal with consistency and constraints and that's why the different possibilities have different probabilities because there's all sorts of constraints in the system that says well this is more probable than that and a lot of that comes from the constraints of what's happened before so uh, I'm sorry to I hope I'm not hogging up too much time but in a sense that if we continue that we are continuing to constrain the system as yes. we make more and more observations or right are we get to the point where we can't move <laughs> or, or well, can that be reversed we get to the point that we can't move when we hit the limits of the resolution of the system. You know, like I was saying before, if you take a particle apart, you're gonna find more particles until you get to a point, one of two things. You've reached the limits of the resolution of the system to produce anything else. You're down to the pixel, all you're gonna see is a pixel. You're not gonna see half a pixel because that doesn't happen. You just can see one pixel volume. So once you hit the end of the resolution, it stops. So you want to make, you want to use possibilities that give you breathing room, right, for future possibilities. So yeah. that's another thing that'll maybe change the probabilities that the system gives you. But in any case, the other thing is, besides running into the, into the bottom of the resolution, is that the system is derived from a rule set and inputs, you know, initial conditions. Whenever you start a simulation, you have rules how everything interacts, and you have initial conditions. What do you start with? What are, the, what are the going in ground rules? And some of those initial conditions will be your resolution, how big or little a delta T you have, you know, how, how, what resolution your distances, your space map is. But uh, one, of the, uh, one of the choices you might have is, well, in this simulation, I don't need to go any more down into the weeds than this far. I don't want to see, I don't need to see anything smaller than a quart. Say, quart is small enough. I can build the whole world on that. I don't need anything down there. So you may have started with initial conditions that spec that that was your base level. You see, if you had initial conditions, that would be your base level and maybe there won't be anything inside of a quart because, you know, you've, uh, you've set that as initial condition. I think that's very unlikely because there's tons of space below before we get to the resolution and if you got that much space there's certainly a lot of things that you can make up that go inside the other things you know so I think it's almost certain that when you break the particles apart that we got now you're going to find more particles because we haven't gotten close to the resolution could be that there was an initial condition set that that's the end so you won't go any further than that but not likely typically you go you know further and further down. We just don't have ways of breaking these particles apart yet. And maybe we never will. So they may just stay the way they are. But if we do, we'll break them apart and the system will make up something else that could be in there. And uh, it doesn't conflict with anything we've gotten. And it'll be an array of those possibilities and we'll pick one and that's what it'll be. So see, all of this flies in the face of materialism, which says whatever is, is. It's just like that. When you look into space, there's something there, and you'll see it. Yeah. Well, the first person that looks and sees it and takes the picture and publishes the article, now everybody else is going to see that too, because now consistency demands that everybody that looks there with that instrument or a similar instrument will see the same thing. Consistency requires that. So once something comes in to the reality frame, it stays in. It doesn't come in and go out. That would be a, not a very good learning, learning place where you know, things come and disappear and go away. Every time you look at it, it's different. You know, that would make it very inconsistent and a tough place to learn. So that's kind of how that, that works. I hope I got to your question. I know these are very hard things to understand because our culture tells us that it's a bottoms up thing and that reality exists and it exists out there and all the science does is look at it and see what's there and that's 
that's at the gut level, you know, at the blood and sinew level of, of understanding, that's what we get out of our culture. And to think any other way is just, that's impossible. This just doesn't make sense, which is exactly the way physicists feel about the double slit experiment. It just doesn't make sense because they've, you know, their culture tells them that that's impossible. It doesn't work that way. Even though their science says, you know, if we call these particles, not, if we don't, you know, if we don't work with them as particles, we work with them as probability distributions, we get this whole science of quantum mechanics that's wonderful. Now, we don't know why that is, but we still call them particles. But we, we know they're not really particles, they're probability distributions, so we say they're not classical particles. They're quantum particles. Well, quantum particles are really not particles, they're probability distributions. And uh, it makes the scientists feel better to call them particles because now they're still materialists and their world still hangs together. It's not a, they don't have a big issue to deal with, so they're, they're just quantum particles. I want to shift back to uh, the issue of, of the ethics and the process of healing, Tom. Okay. And this, this is two questions. I have a tendency to want to make everybody better, to yeah. fix, fix everyone. Uh, I know that's an ego need, and however compassionate, it may not always be what's in the best interest of the larger system. Is it possible that if I go where I'm not asked to go, that I can actually do more harm than good, or does the system protect against that with its various rules? I guess that's the first question. Do you want me to answer one at a time? Yeah, well, I probably have a higher probability of remembering them. <laughs> sure. Okay, then, then you can go on with the, with the next couple. To answer that one, um, it is possible for you to basically bully the system, have it your way, and override what's going on. You can do that if you have, if you bring enough power to the process, if your ability to change the probable reality is strong enough, you can just change it. But a couple of things will happen that make it not so bad if you do do that by accident. And that is that, in my experience, if you have somebody and you, you want to heal them, and they've got whatever, you know, they've got cancer, so you heal them and you basically bully the situation and the cancer's gone. Well, it turns out, you know, six months, a year later, a year and a half, oh, now they've got something else. It's not cancer anymore. Now they have a heart problem. You know, and you deal that and the heart problem goes away. Six months later, they get run over by a truck. You know, it's that kind of thing. You try to bully it, but the system finds a way to work around it. And uh, if that's part of their process, is it's time for them to go because of whatever reason it is, whether it's their personal reason or whether it's connections with the other people they're around, it'll almost always work its way to that conclusion no matter what you do. So at worst, you will probably just prolong something and make it happen later instead of you know, when it was gonna happen without your intervention. So your intervention isn't really gonna mess things up terribly. It may just reroute them. Or, you know, so in that sense, don't feel like I'm afraid to, you know, heal someone because I'm afraid I might be intruding on their free will. Um, I would say that if your gut level says heal them, and at your gut level you wanna heal everybody because you have compassion for everybody, then heal everybody and don't worry about it too much. Those that you're going to run counter to are going to do an end run around your efforts anyway. They'll find some other way to get to where they need to go. You won't really stop them. And what you might do though, is you might change their, their choices. You see, it, when somebody, if somebody's gonna, if somebody needs healing, and often disease itself is a, is a downer. You know, the, your quality of life goes down. You start to think darker thoughts. You start to see the negative side of things and whatever, and then that can snowball into something, whereas you might heal them and they might, oh, gee, I almost died there. And you know, all I thought about was working, you know? I was working 16 hours a day and 
shoot, I've got a whole different attitude toward life now. You know, I'm not going to do that anymore. I, I realize that's not important. Family is important. Love is important. Connections are important. So you might change an attitude, in which case you've given that person a, a different viewpoint, and maybe they don't need to check out just yet. So you see, you, you never know what you might change or what you might do or might, what you might not do. They may have been on a, on a process of checking out because they felt dead-ended here. Nothing was working, they weren't learning anything, and uh, they felt it might as well recycle. And you may end up by getting them out of that negative trance that they're in, give them a whole new lease on life. Or maybe not. You know, maybe it, they keep on going. So don't worry about it too much. You don't want to bully people. And you don't want to have the attitude that I know what's best for everyone. I know it's best for you to get over that thing. And I know what's best, you know, for everybody. So I'm going to arrange, I'm going to make things happen the way I think that they should. You have to get rid of that as a motivation. But if your heart just goes out to someone, oh, look at this lady. You know, she's only 20 something. She's got these little kids. I want to help. Do it. Help. You know, do it. If, if you're messing in her game, she'll find another way. So don't, it's not a real hard problem. It's more, when I say that you should be sensitive to it, it's not that it's going to be a real terrible problem if you heal somebody who doesn't really need it or want it. What's the problem is if you have this attitude of, I know best, I can, I can just do things to people because I can because I have the power and I can change probabilities, then, you know, I'm in charge now. You see, if you have that attitude, that's a bad attitude. But if you just are compassionate and care about people, let it flow. Send that compassion out to them and don't worry too much about what you're doing because it'll work out just fine. Your intent is good and you won't do much harm with a good intent. Well, with regard to expression of the intent in connection with healing, What's a, what's a good tool for becoming the laser beam instead of the flashlight? Uh, you know, we, well, we can say, I, I want this person healed, but that's a very diffuse expression of intent. You can be a lot more potent. You can be, have a lot more effect if you can focus your intent very precisely. Um, if you say, feel better, you know, or you can, you can say, world, world peace for the world. You know, we all need to live happily together and send that out to the world. That does have an effect. That does move the probability of that a little closer to happening because you expressed the intent. But now you're dealing with a probability that has seven billion people, you know, pushing on it, and you're giving it a little tweak up here on the edge. It still, it's a little tweak on the edge. You know, that's good. All those little tweaks add up on the edge. If there was six of those seven billion doing the same thing you were doing, then it would work. The whole thing would move. So it's not like I'm insignificant, you know, I'm only one person, I don't need to vote. You know, that's a wrong attitude, it's, you need to. But um, if you can focus on the detail, okay, if you can focus on the spot, somebody has an ulcer, rather than say, feel good, you know, and uh, hope for them, you know, give them positive energy to, to uh, get over this problem, that will help them get over the problem. But if you can, Visualize is a good way to do it. Sometimes people don't visualize, just do it with feeling or with a focused intent on that ulcer. And if you were doing it visually, you might visually see an ulcer. You know, you might see a piece of something or other and then there's an ulcer spot on it. Well, that's just a symbol. It's a metaphor. The piece of something is the tissue in the intestine and that spot on it is a metaphor for the ulcer. And now you're going to work just on that ulcer. So now your intent instead of feel good goes down to that ulcer needs to be fixed. If you also know some physiology and something about ulcers, you may know about how the cellular, you know, what's going on at the cellular level. But what's happening is that there's irritation there. And if the irritation gets severe enough, you know, the cells uh, maybe break apart and the, and the uh, ulcer is then, uh, you know, has a, has a hole. You get a perforated ulcer. And you may know something about that if you're a physician and you do internal medicine, you probably know a lot about that. And then you can focus your intent on those cells and their, and their uh, um, state of being uh, you know, disturbed. And you might just work on those individual cells and get them to calm down and get rid of all that uh, 
um, irritation. You see, or if you know more, you can work at a, at a cellular or even you know a molecular level at it. And the more focused you are on that particular thing, the more energy you put into changing just that. So now all of your intentional energy is focused on one spot, one ulcer. You'll do a lot more good for that ulcer than you will be healthy, you know. Both work, but one works more specifically. Now the be healthy one may help them in general, not just that ulcer, you know, it may help a little with their, you know, their heart and their liver and other things, you know, their hair may stop thinning and, you know, other things may help on the, the be healthy and you'll have a broader effect but if the ulcer is really the problem that they're suffering from then you take all your intent and focus it much more powerful effect that way and if you get 20 people to do it then it's and they're all of equal ability then it'll be 20 times as much effect that's why group healings are very potent because you have a lot of people it's additive and what you do is additive. So if you, if you heal someone, you work on that ulcer, and then you're done. All right, I worked on them. You know, and then you move on to something else. That will help a little. But if you work on them, and then an hour later you work on them again, and an hour later you work on them again, and you do that for two weeks, your effect will be you know, 14 times greater, or 100 times greater than if you just worked on them once and then let it go. So it's, it's all additive. Every time you add some intent to that probability distribution, you're punching it up a little bit more. And if there's nobody pulling it the opposite direction, it'll stay up like that. You boost that probability up of that healing, and if there's nothing pulling it the opposite way, it stays puffed up. And then you puff it up a little more, a little more, and a little more, and eventually you can, you can get it up. Now, if there's other beings that say, oh, that person really deserves an ulcer, you know, they, you know, nasty person, I don't like them, I wish they'd, you know, go croak with an ulcer, then that's going to be a probability pulling it down. And then you have to pull it up more than they pull it down. And usually that person that's negative about it is the person themselves, their own fear about what's going on. They're the ones that are constantly tugging it in the opposite direction. Very seldom is there somebody else trying to you know, do voodoo on them and make them sick. Usually they're doing voodoo on themselves because of their attitude. Are there rules that the LCS has to obey? For instance, is it a rule that intent is the driving force in a consciousness system? Yes, there are certain things that, uh, that the uh, larger consciousness system must obey. It's got rules too. And its rules are self-imposed. And the reason they're self-imposed is that it has a purpose. Its purpose is to survive, you see? So it wants to lower entropy because that's how it continues. That's how it survives. And it does things in order to lower entropy of the whole. This is why this virtual reality is here because this is a way that speeds up that evolutionary process of lowering entropy of the system. So that's its constraint. And inside this virtual reality, its major constraint is consistency. You know, you can't have that, that, uh, that physicist looking through that telescope in that part of space that nobody's seen before and find little pink elephants, you know, flying around, you know, by flapping their ears out there. You know, that just wouldn't do. So it's constrained. That's a possibility that, it doesn't, that isn't in the distribution because that's not acceptable. So the only things that are in that probability distribution are those things that are possibilities. And they're only possibilities because they fit within the constraints of what we know. So the system is constructed what it can put in there into possibilities. Now the system is not constrained to never cheat or, you know, uh, uh, what should we say, hack the system. It can do that. It can cheat and it can do things that are unusual. It can make sure that if there's somebody out there in that, in that civil war that that uh, needs to survive for some reason, whatever that reason is, that that probability distribution doesn't land a cannonball on them. You see, it can do that if it wants to. Now, generally, it doesn't do that because, you know, it doesn't, you interfere with the experiment, you interfere with what's going on there with the people creating their own feedback and learning. If you mess around too much with it, you get the 
you know, it, it's not good for the learning, it's not good, for, so it's all done in the background and it's done to where nobody notices and it's done only in the margins. It's not something happens, it's, it's not, you know, it, it's not that everybody's being moved around like pieces on a board and only things happen and the things that are, you know, programmed for us to happen. Mostly we're just here and we're interacting and stuff happens and we deal with it and it's, it's just the way it is. You know, there, there's not a lot of that kind of meddling but sometimes the system has this, you know, if that happened, that would be a real, that wouldn't work too well. My plans for lowering entropy, you know, are going someplace else, and they'll just cheat sometimes. It's a digital simulation. You can do anything you want in a digital simulation if you're the one that's running it. I often tell the story of my son playing Age of Empires. You got it. He played, he played Age of Empires. You know, if you want to know about virtual reality, ask somebody, you know, under the age of, uh, you know, 40. <laughs> Probably under the age of 30. Anyhow, he played Age of Empires. And he found out, after he'd played this game for some years, that there was a, there was a hack, there was a cheat code. And, and in Age of Empires, you have, you start with cavemen, right? You start with the very beginning of humans, and then there's these various human civilizations, and they have to go through all the stages of development, you know, so it's kind of a sociology, uh, psychology kind of game, and they have to pass through all these stages. And eventually, they, of course, they war with each other because you want to end up at the end of the game with all the marbles, you know. You, your people control everything. Why not, right? The, it's the way the world works. So anyway, that's the game, and he found out he could put in this code, and even though it was still in the, the, uh, the uh, Stone Age, he could materialize a Mercedes-Benz <laughs> with a atomic weapons launcher in the back seat. And when he was losing badly because he had made a lot of poor decisions, he would get out his Mercedes-Benz, <laughs> point it toward the enemy, and win the game. You know, he didn't do that very often because it really wasn't much fun. After you did it a few times, it's really fun, you know, because you were doing this. But uh, it makes the game not so much fun. But anyway, the, it's just uh, an example that in a digital simulation, anything is possible. So the larger consciousness system can, has constraints, but it can break those constraints. It can do things, but it only happens in the margins because it would mess up its own game if it was heavy handed in it. And they only happen in the margins where nobody notices. Nobody could tell that this guy has walked around and ridden around in all of this cannon fire in the Civil War, you know, for three months and just never got hit. Just wasn't his time to go, you see. And there's some other guy who just gets there on, on day one and ten minutes later a cannonball falls on him. Well, his, he was just the wrong place at the wrong time. So sometimes that's just chance. It doesn't always mean that there's been manipulation going on, but sometimes it happens that you think, eh, you know, there's some, something else going on here. You know, this guy's awful lucky. And some people are just lucky. You'll meet some people, they've been lucky all their life. And there's some people who are just unlucky. And they've been unlucky all their life. And you'll generally find a difference in their attitude. One has a positive attitude and one has a negative attitude. One's creating you know, negative things to happen and the other one's creating positive things to happen. So is it correct to say that the only external constraint that it has is to survive? Yeah, that's its, that's its only external, external constraint, yeah. is that it needs to lower entropy yeah. and it can do whatever it wants, uh, at least in this virtual reality, to make that end happen. Okay. And that's its main constraint. If it does something that increases entropy, it's just shooting itself in the foot, right? That's just not smart. Yeah. And it has other constraints, too, that are practical constraints, such as it wouldn't run a deterministic simulation because that would take a, you know, a billion, billion times more resources and cells and cycles and everything else. And why would you want to do that if you didn't have to? You know, so it has an efficiency constraint, too. It's going to, it's going to evolve. It's evolving. And evolution uh, implies constraints. When you evolve, you have constraints. Evolution doesn't pick the least efficient way to go. You know, evolution is all about efficiency. 
being able to avoid predators is sufficient if what you're trying to do is survive and procreate, right? So it needs to pick efficient processes in order to work so that it uh, maximizes the work that it can do. Efficiency just uses up resources that aren't necessary. And there's no limit to how much entropy it can reduce. I think no. you've said that before, it can just no. evolve No, No, entropy, you know, you reduce entropy, it's, you probably never get to zero. You know, it's not like you can reduce your entropy, you get to zero and you're done. It doesn't work that way. This is a changing, growing, real thing. It's always in motion, it's always in change. So the entropy reduction is, a, is an endless job. You keep working at it but you don't get there. In physics and math, we say you go asymptotic you know, to the axis. You, it, it goes and goes and goes, but it never actually gets there. And that's the way entropy reduction is. So there isn't, a, there isn't an end point where you throw up your hands and say, I win, you know, I got all the points, entropy hit zero, because as soon as you say that and stop trying to reduce entropy, entropy starts growing again. So you can never, you can never say I'm done, because it, as soon as you're not paying attention trying to reduce it, it grows, and you know that in your own life, right? As long as you're working, trying to reduce entropy, then it sort of works, and as soon as you say, oh, to hell with it, you know, well, stuff starts happening, Ent entropy starts bubbling up all over the place. So it's the same way for the larger conscious system. It has to continually work at it, otherwise, it starts going the wrong direction. It's not a kind of thing that you can just finish. It's the kind of thing you have to always work at. If you ever relax, and it's like learning, you know, if you ever stop learning, if you ever stop growing, well, your life starts to become kind of pointless. You don't feel like you're going anywhere or doing anything. So you have to keep learning, keep growing. And that's, the conscious system has that same constraint. It has to keep growing and cre keep becoming. Otherwise, it starts to deteriorate. It starts to die. It starts to go away. So you never, you never get too old to learn something and grow and understand something. And if you are, if you feel like, you know, you don't want to learn anything else, you're kind of dead in place. You see, your, your body may still be kicking, but the rest of you is not, uh, not doing much. Hi, Tom. Yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, mindfulness versus the absent-minded professor. And by mindfulness, I mean living in the moments, um, having a very calm, uh, low-noise consciousness, um, versus the absent mind professor who doesn't necessarily have maybe a lot of noise in their mind, but they're very focused on a, a particular problem. Or let's say they're very busy at their jobs and it's very cerebral. And so they're very focused, or maybe you're reading a really good book and you're very focused on that book mm -hmm. and you kind of don't focus on anything else. In terms of optimizing entropy reduction. Okay, uh, it's yeah. the mindfulness is a better path. Okay, focus is important. If you're healing, focus is important. Um, but being aware of yourself in a bigger picture is where your growth is coming from, and that's your mindfulness. If you're only mindful, again, you know, even mindfulness can, can focus on the details. You know, you can be whatever it is you're doing. You're mowing the grass, and you're just one with the grass, you know, and the mower and the noise, and you're just, and that's all there is in your whole world, but this mower and this grass, and that's still being too focused. You have to be aware of that and kind of be at one with everything. The grass and the mower are part of a bigger picture, and you and the mower are doing your part in this picture for whatever reason. You see, you have to have context. I guess that's really what it boils down to. If you're the absent-minded professor and your context is on some problem you're trying to solve, some equation that you're trying to solve, you see, then that's a context that doesn't really give back a lot, other than you may solve the equation. But as far as growth goes, it doesn't give back a lot. And if you're mindful and all you're doing is becoming one with your lawnmower, that doesn't really give back a lot either. You have to see yourself in the context of a bigger picture and a larger reality, and that you're doing, what you're doing now is your intentional part in this life, in this reality, and then you will grow and you'll learn because you'll see yourself as a part of the whole. So I think it's that, that kind of a, the context has to be big picture context. 
as long as it's little picture context, it can slow you down. And it doesn't matter whether that's, you know, being mindful or being an absent-minded professor. Either one can be good, either one can be bad. If that absent-minded professor is thinking about his problem in terms of everything, you know, it's not just this little equation that solves this little bump somewhere that doesn't really relate to the rest of the world very much, then he's too focused. But if he's solving a big cosmological problem or this or that, or he's talking about a theory of everything and he kind of has a big picture in it, then he can be focused on that because he's focused on the big picture at the same time. But mostly absent-minded professors are focused on details. Sometimes they're not. It's hard to tell. You know, it depends on, on what's going on in their head. But that's, uh, the absent-minded professor is probably a, not a bad way to start because you do need to focus on things. You know, your intention needs to be put on what you want it to be on. And even if what you want it to be on is everything, that's still a focused intention because otherwise you're just drifting. You know, if you, you know, you get this idea, you know, you're sitting on a toadstool with your legs crossed going, you know, and you're just there. Well, if there's no focus on anything and you're just existing in the moment, well, that's a good meditation. But you can't spend your life meditating or it won't be good. It'll be too narrow a focus. So you can, even your meditation focus can be too narrow a focus. You've got to be in this world and you've got to be a part of it and you have to see yourself as a part of it and be integrated with it and still realize that your part, what you're doing right now, is significant and important. It's how you learn and how you grow. And as long as you keep that in mind, I'd call that the mindfulness thing, is to keep in mind what you're doing, why you're doing it, and how does it fit into the big picture of everything? How are you connected to it all? That's the, that's the growth path. So if you had to pick one or the other, if you had to be focused on something that was only relevant to a detail, or focused on everything all at once, the everything all at once is gonna pay more pay dirt than, than not. But you really need to be not just existing to that all at once, you need to really understand your part in it and what you're doing, why you're doing it. You need to have some sense of context of why you're there. So if you're mowing the grass and you're one with your mower and the grass and so on, you have to see that grass and that mower and you and the lawn and the house and the neighborhood and the rest is somehow all connected. And you're doing your part to make that neighborhood more attractive, more aesthetically pleasing, and that that's important to you. And if you see that as your connection to it, then it makes what you're doing significant. Not just a chore you have to get done. Because if you have that attitude, then you're grumpy. And you're not really learning anything. If you see how you fit in, then you are. Did that? Yeah, definitely that, that helps. Uh, on a personal level, I've, I find in my, let's say my day-to-day -day job, it's, I, I find myself having to fix very technical problems quickly and I find I have to focus very attentively on these problems and I find that it takes me a while to kind of disconnect from that once the problem has been rectified sure. and I'm at you know at the, it's the end of the workday I'm going home and I'm trying to just kind of let all that go and move on right. and meditate a little bit but I'm still thinking about those problems right. from the day well both of those are good you see that's fine because when you're working on that problem you and that problem are kind of one together. You and the problem are connected. And that kind of focus is a good thing. You know, and I, I would not leave you with the impression that you should avoid that, that it's not a good thing. It is a good thing. That's how you solve problems, is you focus on them. You can't solve them if you don't focus on them. And sometimes that focus has to go over days or weeks where you're focused on them and you're just kind of blindly stumbling through the rest of your life because you're focused on this problem. That's not necessarily a bad thing unless you do that all the time, you know, month after month after month. Then you're missing a lot of what's important if you do that. But to do it for a while, sure. Good focus is, is, uh, is a good trait to have. Just it doesn't get excessive is the, is the problem. As long as you still focus on the other things and you're not just, just that one thing, then there's no problem with that. But, but when you do go home, you know, try to let it go. It's a different world now. <laughs>
you know, different world. You know, my wife and my kids, my dog, my cat, you know, they need my attention too. And just get into that world with the same intensity that you got into the solving the technical problem intensity. And you'll find your life will get richer and it won't hurt your solution on the technical problem. Matter of fact, the break from it that you take in getting into your family with the same intensity will actually help you solve the technical problem. Because partly the problem, what we have in solving technical problems is we get wound up around the axle with our own, with our own approaches. And if you can take a break sometimes and then get back to it, new insights will come that wouldn't come if you just kept staring at it. So they all work together. Okay. Okay, so the probability is affected by intent. Yes. Okay. And then with the decision space, how is all of that interconnected? Your decision space widening and probabilities and intent, okay. does that make sense Yeah, now? I can understand what, you, what you're asking. There is a thing called decision space, and decision space is a word that means all of the things that are in your choices. We're talking about choices with decision space. So you approach any particular thing and you could make maybe 10 different choices of how you react to that thing. And that's your decision space. Now, if you approach that very same thing and you could see 100 different choices that you could make, you'd have a bigger decision space. If you approach it and you only see one way to go, there are no other ways to go but this one, then you only have one item in your decision space and it's really, really small. So decision space comes and goes with you know, what you're doing, an event and so on. As you, as you grow, as you uh, lower your entropy, your decision space gets bigger because you see the world from a bigger perspective. So before you only saw the world from this little perspective and you interpret it from that perspective, but now you can see it from lots of different perspectives and you realize that you could approach that problem you know, all sorts of ways, or maybe the problem isn't even a problem. When you look at it from a different viewpoint, it may not even be a problem, you see? So the bigger your reality, the lower, the lower your entropy, the bigger your reality, the bigger your decision space. Now, you can modify probability of what occurs after you make a decision. So here's your decision space, and I, want, I would like for, you know, not to rain all day today. So that's, that's one of my things I'd just not like it to do, just pour down rain all day. So I may have an intent for it not to rain. So I make a decision, if you will. I make a choice to, have, to do that. So I may put energy into, let's not have rain today. Let's just rain someplace else, but not here. Okay, not on this day. And if you do that, then the probability of it raining here today will go down. Just a little, unless there's a whole bunch of farmers that really need the rain, and they're always hoping that it's going to rain, and then it'll go up, you see? So you will change that. So that's kind of the relationship between uh, uh, decision space is the choices we have, okay? Some of them are good choices, some of them are bad choices. The point of the choice is that you make a choice that lowers your entropy. You know, it's, a, it's an intent. It's a good intent. It's a loving intent. It's a caring intent. And if you do that, caring, loving, being compassionate, those are all low entropy choices. If it's a high entropy choice, it can lower, I mean, it can lower your quality of your consciousness, it can raise your uh, entropy. And that would be a choice that would be an angry, a fearful, a controlling choice, you know. Th those kinds of things then work to the opposite. And if you put intentional energy into those, you're raising and lowering the probability that they'll go either way. So if you're around people who are very negative, after a while, it just doesn't feel good to be around people like that, you know? And it's not so much that they do things that hurt you or whatever, is it just, it's not, doesn't feel good to be around people like that, and that's because they're constantly, you know, helping things come into this reality that are unpleasant. They see everything that's unpleasant and don't notice all the things that are wonderful because that's the way their focus is. So they only have a little decision space. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but that's how all the things are related. So you have decision space, which is how many choices you have. Then you have your intention to make the choice. 
And then when you make the choice, that intention will modify future probability. And that'll either all help you grow up or help you not grow up, help you grow down. So that's what we're in here. That's what we're doing here is we're making choices. We have free will, we make choices, and we grow or, or uh, not grow based on the choices we make. And we change the reality, we change what it is we deal with based on our intention. So this is a learning place. This is a schoolhouse, and we have feedback. Mm -hmm. And we get, we get feedback about our success of, of growing up. And if our, if our life is a miserable life and it's all full of, you know, it's a soap opera and all terrible things happen, that's probably because we're part of all that. We create that. We are around other people who create that. So all of us together tend to pull our, our group reality, you know, down to something that isn't pleasant. So that's, the key here is that you end up realizing that it's everything is your responsibility. Mm -hmm. You see, it's not that others are doing this to you, it's that you're doing this to yourself. You have responsibility to make the best choices you can, and then you have to, you live with the results. So it's not his fault anymore? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I doubt that. I think by definition it's always his fault, isn't it? <clears throat> That's his job, is to be at fault. You worked with Tom early on, I understand, and you know, is your view of reality pretty similar to Tom's on this, or are there differences that you'd uh, we suggest? Started out on the same road, and then <clears throat> the path branched, and he took the inner road, and I took the outer road more. So most of my um, perceptions have been formed in a you know, 40 years of martial arts in the in the outer world, but a lot of the same principles apply. You have to have mental discipline and focus and intent and uh, try to <clears throat> divorce your emotions from the actions and, and a lot of things. But uh, what happened at uh, Monroe's was extremely interesting and it definitely uh, opened my eyes to a lot of things that I had not really paid a lot of attention to. And other experiences after that. Um, so uh, my worldview is probably <clears throat> in the outer fringes of humanity. 